Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Leo Murphy, Principal and Chief Executive of the Northwest Regional College, and I'd like to welcome you today to this fantastic online event on FinTech in Further Education. Creating skills for economy is very important, and Further Education is at the centre of this activity across the six regional colleges in Northern Ireland. This afternoon, we will develop how the six further education colleges and the FinTech Centre are working in partnership to create the skills and talent required to build back a stronger economy for Northern Ireland. For the past decade, we have been working with terrific companies, including Allstate, Fintrue, Alchemy and Deloitte on the Assured Skills Academy programmes and other partnerships to ensure that we are producing the skilled workforce for both young people and returning adults in further education for the Northern Ireland economy. The FinTech Centre has boomed across Northern Ireland in the past years, with countless firms recognising us now as one of the leading centres in the world for FinTech. This is a fantastic endorsement of our sector, the further education sector, which has been key, along with the universities, in supporting this development. So today we look forward to hearing from the FinTech industry as well as college leaders and students on how co-working relationships have helped us to get to this place. Further education is growing stronger, and now both sectors see it as vital if the partnership is to work and continue to grow. I will pass you now on to our host, who is the BBC broadcaster, Clodagh Rice, who is going to lead us through the discussion with our panellists. Before that, we hope to now show you a short video from our uh, chair of the Economic Engagement Group, Elaine Flynn. And Elaine will talk through about the importance of the employer and college relationship. Thank you, and I'll speak to you at the end of the programme. Good morning, everyone. My name is Elaine Flynn. I'm Head of Business Services at CERC. I'm currently of the Economic Engagement Working Group for the further education sector. The group has representation from the six FE colleges in Northern Ireland. I am supported this year by my Vice Chair, Fergal Tuffy from Northwest Regional College. Our group works very closely with the business community of Northern Ireland to ensure there is sufficient provision to meet the upskilling, reskilling and innovation demands in the priority skills sectors. We navigate each of our college specialisms to provide, inform and design curriculum and accredited training from level two right up to level seven. Due to the pandemic, Department for the Economy are now 100% funding a suite of provisions to support both individuals and businesses. The pandemic has resulted in the colleges in Northern Ireland working more collaboratively than ever. We have a wide menu of digital products that cover digital, basic digital skills up to the more complex graduate offerings in areas such as cyber, data analytics, digital marketing, software testing and ethical hacking. The FE sector is working with a flexible digital strategy that develops and integrates digital platforms and tools. It promotes a comprehensive, continuous professional development approach for all staff. The FE sector also has addressed digital poverty with provision of laptops, hardware and access. The pandemic has significantly increased tutor skills in using online technology. The key provision for the fintech sector has saw partnerships between the FE sector and large foreign direct investment companies choosing Northern Ireland for their talent. Significant partnerships such as PwC, Fintrue, Alchemy and Deloitte have been facilitated through the Assured Skills Academies and have allowed more colleges to be involved in these provisions. The work of the Economic Engagement Working Group is continuously aligned to Northern Ireland's strategic objectives and will continue to work to support economic recovery and future-proof talent required for the significant growth in industries such as fintech. As I said there, due to the pandemic, DFE are now 100% funding all of these provisions, so it's a great time to look at our support options. Information can be found at any of the college's pages, and I'm also happy if anyone wishes to contact me directly. Thank you. Hello and welcome, and thank you all so much for joining us at home virtually for this panel discussion about fintech and further education. My name is Clodagh Rice, I'm the business correspondent at BBC Northern Ireland, and I'm joined by a panel who have decades of experience in the industry. So if I take a look around now who we're joined by, we've got Andrew Jenkins here, who is the FinTech Envoy for Northern Ireland, who was appointed back in 2019. I know Andrew's also been working on the FinTech strategy, so I'm keen to hear a lot about that um, as we get on through the discussion. 
We're also joined by Tracy Gillen, who's a new member of the fintech industry who has uh, made the switch from pharmacy to fintech just two years ago. So we'll hear how you made that journey. I'm also joined by Damien Duffy, who is the director of curriculum at Belfast Met with a lot of experience in things like assured skills and apprenticeships and those different routes into the sector. And last but not least, we've got John Healy, who is the managing director of Allstate. He leads the technology arm of the American insurance firm. And we'd also love to hear your questions today. So there will be a chat box on the YouTube stream. So we're very keen if you want to get involved in the conversation, please feel free to send us your questions and we can put those to our panelists throughout the event. So first of all, um, I actually thought off thought I would start off with a bit of an anecdote, um, basically just to talk about what is fintech, because for many of you up here with decades of experience in the sector, it might seem very obvious, but I actually had this conversation with a colleague recently um, whenever we were referring to it in the news and somebody said about financial technology jobs and I said, but I'm okay to say fintech, you know, people know what fintech is and the colleague who I won't name went, oh yeah, Oh, I've heard, I've heard of FinTech. Yeah, I know that company. Where are they based? And I was like, maybe, maybe we need to do a little bit more in terms of raising awareness of all of the kind of potential opportunities in the sector. Um, so first of all, I'm going to just put that very basic question to you, Andrew. I mean, how would you define FinTech? So that sounds like a very good place to start. Uh, so when, I, when we talk about FinTech, uh, FinTech is short for uh, financial technology. So if you take the first three letters of financial, and you take four letters of technology, you get fintech. And when I think about fintech, um, in its simplest terms, it's about bringing technology and innovation into financial services. And that can span across a whole range of different things from, from payment to, to banking, to pensions, to wealth management. But if I, if I use an example, um, and it takes me back quite a while to when I got my first, uh, my first job and I had, to, I had to go and open a bank account and I remember actually physically going, have to, going down to the bank and meeting with a bank manager and bringing down ID and other papers to show that I was who I was. Um, and I remember uh, my dad also telling me at the same time, one of the most important relationships you'll ever have is with your bank manager. Well, I've only ever met my bank manager once. I think his name was Brian, and that was about 30 years ago. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of testament to how things have progressed within financial services digitalization of banking services come on so much. Everything that um, we, we once had to do in a physical bank, you can now do online, but, not also, but also we have the emergence of digital banks as well, like, like Monzo and like Revolut and like Starling. So there's been huge disruption uh, in financial services and uh, not just in banking. Um, so when I think about uh, FinTech and I think about the disruption, I think about how consumer uh, demand and how consumer, how we use financial services has really transformed um, uh, FinTech to what it is today. And in terms of the presence, you know, of the sector locally in Northern Ireland, John, if I could bring you in on this, you know, I, I mean, Austin is a massive employer. Do you think people might not realize quite the extent of the opportunities locally in this sector? Oh, I think, Loda, that is absolutely true. And I think whenever I started off in my career, uh, way back 30 years ago, uh, I had no idea uh, about what uh, financial technology, what fintech uh, was about. And I started and I had to go away to London to get into uh, this particular uh, career and, uh, and then subsequently have, have come back. But it's just amazing to look at how the sector here has developed, particularly over the last 12 to 15 years. Uh, you, you said in your anecdote about the fintech company, where are they based? Well, fintech's based everywhere and even more so today with uh, what we've been through over the last 18 months with the pandemic and uh, you know we have got a real burgeoning uh, fintech economy right across uh, Northern Ireland and the opportunities uh, that are out there for somebody who is considering a career in fintech uh, are and it's not without uh, you know hyperbole to say w without limit you know there it's just a fantastic array right across the sector uh, and the businesses large and small companies like my own with two and a half thousand people uh, working in the sector down to entrepreneurial startups with one or two people quite literally in their bedrooms you know the, the, there's just so much uh, exciting technology that's getting delivered and, and helping to revolutionize financial services. 
I suppose there are such a broad range of roles that, I mean, hopefully there'll be lots of people listening who might want to get involved. I mean, Damien, would, could you give us an overview of maybe some of the options, potential routes in for people who might hear the sound of this and think this is something that I would really like to pursue? Yeah, I think, uh, Claudia, if I was probably looking back 10 or 15 years ago, it was a sort of traditional pathways into financial services, you know, the sort of accountancy, finance background, you know, sort of uh, skill sets in mathematics, but the financial technology um, evolution has sort of transformed all of that. And, and now we're having, um, through apprenticeship programs and Assure Skills programs, a mix of different skill sets, people with arts backgrounds, law backgrounds, uh, financial backgrounds, physicists, aeronautical engineers. So the range of sort of uh, pathways and, and academic backgrounds that can lead you into the financial technology sector now is, is, is quite broad. And actually, we've got one perfect example of that. Um, Tracy, if we could maybe bring you in at this point. So talk us through, I mean, you started off in pharmacy. That was quite the shift. I mean, what what was your kind of motivation? Why, why did you decide to do that? So a way back when, <laughs> whenever I actually left school the first time, um, like many people, I went straight to work and I got into pharmacy, I got into boots and it was it ended up being a 16 17 year career for me um, i worked my way up i started off in the counter and worked my way all the way up to technician ict level um, and i got to a point where i wasn't going any further without my degree and i just seen it as an opportunity to break away so i went back to the college here um, and actually did my access diploma over two years and carried on then and did my foundation degree in business and management um, before going to Inverness then to finish the degree. So while I was over there, I started to think about more seriously, what am I going to do when I get this? So the goal was the degree, but ultimately it was a career change at the end. And whilst I was researching what I would do, I the graduate roles always jumped out to me. The academy entry jumped out. Um, like I was saying earlier, the, the academy, I think, is perfect for those coming straight out of school and helping them transition into employment. But from, I suppose, my own personal background, I've seen the academy as a great platform to transition into a new industry as well. So when I went, came home from Inverness, I was looking for a graduate role. I reached out to past lecturers and teachers at the college, tell them to keep their ear to the ground. Um, and I suppose that was the great thing about being able to tap in again whenever I came back. I had people in the know and they contacted me and says there was a workshop at the Millennium Forum. So I turned up at this day and asked a lot of questions and just thought this is right up my street. It's everything I'm looking for. There was like the six weeks of the academy, which again brought me back to the college and McGee. So I got to see all them lectures again. They were all so encouraging and congratulating like how far we've came. Um, and they really supported me throughout the six weeks. Like the academy gave you the great foundation skills for going into another industry. There's new terminology and language for you to get used to. So it's not so alien then when you get into employment. Um, so that's really what I done. Like it was the college, uh, the degree, the academy, and then transition and then right into Fintry. And uh, the academy, I believe, just completely, it fully prepped you for what would be expected of you and what you would expect them getting into the role. And Damien, would that sort of experience be typical of the sorts of stories that you hear through these Assured Skills Academies? Yeah, I mean, Assured Skills Academy in the last four or five years has been a game changer in terms of creating alternative pathways into, into a whole range of technology companies, not only financial services, financial technology, but um, we've also got the professional services sector as well, which has tapped in. And Fintry has been one of the companies that has been, you know, thereabouts and in, involved in academies almost from the outset. Um, I think that the, the structure of the academies is such that there's, there's an, a sort of technical aspect to academies for people. So people are coming from non-traditional backgrounds, you know, um, are able to sort of tap into a particular experience that prepares them for, for, for the world of work that they're, they're going into. And then there's the soft skills. So there's a mix of technical and soft skills. And I think that's equally important. You know, we're, we're, we're preparing people for that, that interview to get to, to put them right into employment. 
the success rate for people going through the academy program and into into um, straight into employment is is in, in the mid 90s. So, um, as a program creating alternative pathways to, to graduate employment, it has been phenomenally successful across Northern Ireland. Yeah, because I suppose it's going to be in, uh, you know attractive not just for the people going through the academies, but also from the employer's point of view. John, you know, are do you think that we need to do more of this in terms of trying to help match up the people who are looking for work to the skills that employers actually really need? Oh, I, I think that that is just the most amazing story, uh, you know, from pharmacy to, to fintech, uh, and, and it you know, really encapsulates what, what we need to encourage everybody who maybe has you know, made some, some career choices or, or course choices and are thinking, oh my God, I'm stuck. Uh, with with my, with my choice, no, you're not. You know there are just so many options that that are available, and uh, as employers, we are incredibly open to people coming through in 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 all the different ways. You know through uh, traditional courses at, at university and college, uh, but also in terms of making use of assured uh, skills type programs, the academy model uh, coming through, and, and and as well as the the uh, increasing use of apprenticeships for companies like, like mine to bring people through. And, and what we find is that people who are coming through who are really making positive choices around you know, moving into technology and moving into financial technology uh, make for excellent employees. We, we see it time and time again. Uh, our apprentices who are coming through uh, on the apprenticeship routes uh, are uh, typically top of, the, top of their class you know, because they're getting great experience in the workplace, great academic uh, tuition in the in the universities and colleges, uh, and it's just you know great now for us as employers to be realizing that it is about these other alternative routes to bring people through, uh, and there's no doubt about it. Uh, at the moment, it is very much a candidate-led market for recruitment, and you know for somebody who's making a choice around well, you know I, I'm currently doing this job or that job, but I want to move into this sector. You know not, now is the time to do it in, in terms of acquiring the skills. Uh, you know, come and inquire from the, the, the colleges around how to get onto some of these uh, other pathways uh, and then come through into what are uh, or what is a, a, a super sector with just so much upside potential. I know that it has been tough, um, you know, not just for this sector, but right, right across the board in terms of trying to find people at the moment. Um, I mean, Andrew, in terms of is that a concern that you have? Do you think that that could hold back growth in the sector if there aren't more you know, uses or maybe overlaps between further education and different sectors to try and um, make sure that we can find enough people to keep up with this level of growth? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, when I, when I think about where we, where we want to take the fintech sector, you know, over the next three to five years, our talent pool in Northern Ireland is one of our greatest, if not our greatest asset, but it's one of those assets that we need to, we need to really protect and need to focus in on. Um, because at, at the moment, as John said, it is very much a candidate market. Uh, in the many years that I've worked in Northern Ireland, I've never seen the, the market so hot. And I think that's testament to, um, not to the quality of the people, uh, the people that we have here. And you know, when, I, when I speak to the fintech companies, uh, it, what is very clear to me is the vast array of different roles that there are when I speak to the founders, people who have who've set up companies for the first time, who have come from completely different, um, maybe completely different backgrounds, and have found a problem that they want to solve, and have built a company around that problem. I speak with the technologists in fintech companies as well, and again, you can break break that down into so many different roles, from from data scientists to people that are, you know, building mobile applications. Uh, you have people there that are that are defined, designing the the interfaces. For, for these applications as well. So there's such, such a huge array of, um, of different roles within the sector. But I think also uh, it's the, the types of problems that those fintech companies are, are trying to solve. Um, and we have a couple of companies in, based in, um, in Northern Ireland who are doing some fantastic work around fintech as a force for good. You know, a company called um, Esther who are a pocket-to-pocket -pocket giving app, and what they're doing is they're matching up donations to people who, who are really in need um, and making, making that transfer of funds much quicker and much easier. So I think it's a, it's a fantastic industry for people who, are, who want to really make a difference to society, but I think it's also a great opportunity just through the vast array of different roles that there are available. 
Um, so we've had our first question, and I'm going to put it to each of you, but I'm going to put it to Tracy first. <laughs> it's basically, what is your advice for anyone who is looking to get a job in fintech? So I would say get, get in contact with a college at least. Um, if you're thinking of applying, absolutely go for it. Don't hold back. Like the support and encouragement is there, 100 step, 100 percent, um, every step of the way. Um, the co the college and the t lectures they want you to do your best and reach your potential. So, advice is absolutely go for it. And Andrew, what would your advice be? Uh, I suppose my would my advice would be. To, to be curious because as I said there's 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 so much happening within the fintech sector today um, it's about matching up your your aspirations and your your where you see your career path going with the opportunities that are there but definitely being curious asking questions because fintech is moving so fast you know the technologies that we had you know six months ago are are, are oftentimes now outdated with something else so Keep learning, keep understanding what's happening in the fintech sector and asking questions. And Damien, what would your advice be? Um, similar to Andrew's, actually, when he, when he says about being curious, I would you know, say to anyone who's prospective uh, applicant into, into the industry to be open-minded about the opportunities. Don't sort of have a fixed view of, you know, I've done an arts degree or a law degree or a science degree. You know, be open-minded about the possibilities to get into the fintech, fintech industry and that sort of mindset will open up the avenues for you to, to make your way into the sector. And I suppose, John, that kind of echoes what you had previously said about, you know, if you're feeling stuck, you know, there are opportunities out there. Oh, there, there there's no such thing as the, the career for or the job for life, uh, you know, so nobody should ever feel that, that they're stuck. And, you know, if, if I was thinking about making a change and getting into the sector, I, I would go and talk to some of the companies or talk to some of the people who work within these companies. Uh, we all have open days uh, at, at the colleges. Uh, you know, we should come along and, and have a chat to some of the people who are doing the jobs, find out how they got into their uh, particular roles and then see whether or not that is for, for you. But undoubtedly, you know, you need to touch back in with the, the colleges uh, as well. You know, because there are so many routes, maybe it is a bit confusing uh, and the might colleges might seem daunting, I guess, uh, and yeah. the colleges can help you pick through to see whether or not it is uh, an assured skills uh, academy type model that might uh, accelerate you into a role or, or whether or not you're at a stage in your in your learning where you want to do uh, some extended period, maybe within the college, actually doing a, a foundation degree that leads on to an apprenticeship and then ultimately to permanent employment. You know, it, it's about you know, what's that what's that right path for you and there are plenty uh, of uh, advisors within the colleges uh, and certainly as employers would be very happy to, to have those kind of conversations with people who are interested in, in making that transition i know you mentioned it has been very tough to find people at the moment well just i know i know anecdotally from speaking to people it's very tough to find a lot of people in a lot of sectors at the moment but i mean in terms of you making your case for why fintech is an attractive industry to work in you know i suppose maybe the pandemic has has made it that even potentially more attractive well technology technology has always been a, a sector that has been really flexible uh, in, in terms of how people carry out their work you know yes we've got uh, office and all nice office spaces and people work within them but we've always had flexibility in terms of people working from home so whenever that call came 18 months ago for all of us to work from home it was a very easy transition for technology companies like ours to be able to, 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 to do that. Uh, and we really, we've carried on in that mode the whole way through the, the pandemic. Yes, it is hard to find people to come and take our jobs, but even with that, uh, this year alone, we have hired 178 people into our business. You know, that is a company in and of itself. You know, so there is a, a huge demand for the for the skills and the people are out there and, and they're coming and wanting to be part of what we're what we're building and, and what others within the sector uh, are building. And even with that, there is still more demand uh, within the system that, that we need more people to be thinking about how do they move across and into what is a real go ahead type of sector. Uh, and, you know, through through the pandemic, uh, we, we didn't miss a beat in terms of delivery back to our, our customers. Uh, you know, we didn't have to take a penny of uh, support from, from government. You know, that would be you know, universal across the, across the sector, maintain full employment. And because of the, the way that we work and the type of jobs we have, then we've also been able to, to help and look after to people in, in, while, they, while they worked at home and, uh, and, and been very sensitive to the, the demands and competing demands that, that people have. 
you know, so really, you know, you, you talked about purpose and, you know, that uh, fintech you know, is, a, is a sector that has, has purpose, uh, but it's also, you know, a sector that has, you know, a very strong culture, a very strong focus on, on, on well-being for, for its employees, and very importantly, a real strong focus on career growth. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you come through and into uh, the sector, you know, you, there's so many different job families and job types, and we will help and nurture people in terms of helping them into the right kind of job and then helping them as they progress through their uh, through their career as well. Um, Andrew, is that something that you're keen to shout about, particularly given so many sectors have had such a tough 18 months throughout the pandemic to say, you know, demand is still here and growing. So if you have been affected or, you know, if you a lot of people maybe just took had some time to maybe think and reevaluate what they want to do, you know, are you keen to say this is one area where there is still, you know, significant growth? I mean, we've, we've seen that growth, Cloda, um, even through um, lockdown over the last 18, 18 months, 20 months, companies are still growing in Northern Ireland, like, like all state and new companies are, are coming into Northern Ireland. So there, there, there's been, you know, we're not seeing any tail off in terms of, of that demand. I think when, jo when John said about, um, about career growth, that is critically important. Learning agility is one of the, the biggest skills, I think, that um, you know, we, 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 uh, we want to develop within our, within our people today, is that desire and aptitude to move around within organizations, um, because technology changes and wants and needs change, um, and it's incumbent, I think, on, on um, companies to help develop that, um, that muscle, that learning agility muscle, but also for, for people to be willing to, uh, to we sometimes take a little bit of a risk, a little bit of a jump and learn new things. So the demand is still there. And I think you know, having, having multiple, multiple pathways, more pathways into the sector is critically important because we know that we, well, it's gonna be very difficult to sustain that demand if we, if we don't identify additional creative ways to, to um, broaden, that, um, broaden that pipeline of talent. It's funny that you described it as risky there because that's exactly what I was thinking when Tracy was speaking. You know, I'm sure, you know, you know and it even ties in with what John said earlier about this idea of a job for life. So, you know, you study one thing and you do it. I mean, Tracy, is there anything that you think, was it the teachers that you had mentioned in terms of how could you make a changing of path seem less risky or less daunting? It probably was like I, I obviously had the thought of the career change and had no idea where to start and as you say a job for life and you did like back then I got stuck in that mindset of well pharmacy is all I know I can't do anything else and it really was just reaching out to the, at that time at the, to the college was my first protocol and speaking to teachers and lectures and then assuring me like this is an, this is something that people do. Uh, you are not on your own, and you have us every step of the way. And they they lived up to their word. Um, yep, a job for life. It's there's no such thing no more. Um, and it's never too late. It's absolutely not. And I feel like at the, at the beginning I was winging it, but as time went on, it all seemed to work out in my favour. Like. Fintry coming to Derry at that time when I wanted a graduate role, I wanted to come home, I didn't want to go away no more. It was all on my doorstep. Um, and as you were saying as well, Andrew, about the different opportunities within, um, I can see like after a career in pharmacy, there was a very direct path. There wasn't much branching out. Whereas in the fintech world, there's so much opportunity in different areas, different products, different teams and different clients. There's, I, don't, I feel like you'll never get bored in this job. <laughs> well, I mean, Tracy, just to pick up on something you said there in terms of how important the teachers, you know, that sort of support network was, you know, if I could maybe bring in Damien on this mm -hmm. point, you know, what, what role do you think or, or what sort of advice could teachers and people working in the education sector give young people in terms of how they can how can they can move forward well i think we've had a description there a great description of what what life is like in, in a college and the support networks that exist across the fe colleges and i think that is a unique selling point for us you know the sort of level of wraparound pastoral care access to career advice um, connections with employers so we would say you know, as a sector 
we are, we are very hands-on with employers. We're involved in conversations with a range of employers and in the co-creation of new solutions. So, um, so I think you know, in that space, we are committed uh, equally to look at the development of new curriculum within the colleges because we are you know, exploring uh, the work that the FinTech NI strategy has mapped out for the future. They talk about a talent ecosystem. Um, we need to know and understand what our role and contribution can be. Um, colleges working alongside universities, we have a unique contribution to make. So, you know, both, you know, bringing the nature of the experience within an FE college and also um, for us to innovate within our own curriculum to create new opportunities for the new occupations that will come over the next number of years. We've already um, punched well above our weight in certain sort of aspects of, of um, the support we've delivered in data analytics and cyber. We've led the field in Northern Ireland and working with the, the fintech sector, but there's more work to be done in artificial intelligence and regulatory technology. I was just talking to Andrew before we kicked off here. So the, so the pace of change in the sector uh, warrants that we in the sector keep up with that pace of change. So we need to be more agile, I think, within the ecosystem to make sure that we can um, play our part in the future. The one thing to understand with this sector is that in our economic strategy for Northern Ireland, we've called this out as a priority sector. In the 10X economic strategy, FinTech and financial services is going to be something that will differentiate Northern Ireland in terms of competition around the globe. This will be a space where we will be as, as good as it can be in terms of our capability and, and the growth of this um, particular sector. And can I ask a question that might sound like a silly one, but you know, in case there are any kind of young people watching and thinking, what, what are the differences in terms of these pathways? You know, what, what would your advice be in terms of whether you're considering an apprenticeship or an assured skills academy, is it very... It, 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 yes, it, it, it literally is. It's, it's a personal choice. Some people want to come for the, the college experience, you know, uh, you know uh, the, the higher level, higher education experience, and, 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 and that's the pathway that, cho that they choose. Other people want to go an apprenticeship route way, so they want to go into the world of work. They still come to the college one day a week, so they're still following their, their programme of studies, but they're, they're complementing that programme of studies with you know, hands-on experience in the workplace. So really, um, people choose different pathways. Uh, and I think that is, when we talk about the talent pipeline, it's how we mix and match all of those pathways. And, and uh, we referred to it earlier on in terms of traditional graduate pathways, a shared skills uh, academies, and then higher level apprenticeships and apprenticeships. It's creating that sort of funnel into the pipeline of people, um, which will, will create the sort of critical mass of skills that we need to grow this industry. Because, you know, that's what we've called out. We want to grow fintech and the financial services sector and all of the parts of the ecosystem and in order to do that skills and a talent pipeline is going to be a fundamental part of that and um, we've had a great question here from paul clancy from Derry chamber for yourself andrew just in terms of you know what more do you think we can do to try and sell northern ireland fintech globally so um there's definitely more we can do um i think we, there's been a couple of reports that have been published recently that um, kind of tell us what we already knew, that we are very good at, at certain things. Are we just too modest? I think there's a little bit of modesty <laughs> in there for sure. And I think there's maybe time to park the modesty um, a little bit. But to give you an example, um, there was a UK uh, FinTech Independent Strategic Review published um, and Northern Ireland was called out as being the number one uh, place in the UK for, for regulatory technology. Um, and not a lot of people know what regulatory technology <laughs> is, so we need, to t we need to kind of dispel some of the myths around what regulatory technology is. Um, so absolutely, there's, you know, we have that kind of external validation of what we are good at in Northern Ireland. Um, mentioned about the cybersecurity sector, yeah. big data and analytics. And I think it's about, about pack packaging that up and putting together a really compelling value proposition. Um, and FinTech, isn't just a, a Belfast or a Greater Belfast phenomenon. It is a whole of Northern Ireland. Um, you know, it's, it's a full sectoral and irrespective of what part of, of Northern Ireland we're in. So I think we do need to do more uh, around selling, um, selling that, uh, that story uh, nationally and internationally. And sort of off the back of that, I guess, you know, is, is part of doing that trying to raise awareness of the contribution that the sector makes you know maybe because it is so wide-ranging people might not think of it to kind of clump it all together uh, yeah i mean the 
when, when, we, when we've, done, we've done some analysis in the past just to look at what the value of the sector is, and the, the company work, we worked with determined that the fintech sector in Northern Ireland is generating between two and a half and five times as much value as comparable sectors in other parts of the UK. So that in itself, I think, is a very important um, selling point. But I think uh, what we need to do is really play to our strengths um, and focus in on those, those things we are, are really good at. And there are aspects of our technology cluster in Northern Ireland and our fintech cluster in Northern Ireland we are really good at. Um, and I think that's where we need to focus our, our energy um, going forward. And that's part of, of the three-year strategy is to focus in on our strengths. And part of that is raising the profile and the eminence of the fintech sector in Northern Ireland. Yeah, because funny, I was I wanted to ask you about this strategy and I appreciate there's probably a lot in it, but you know, could you give us some of the key points? I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of them there in terms of, you know, what more should we be doing over the next three years to try and, I suppose, make the most of the potential that's there? Well, it'll come as no surprise that talent and skills is right up there as one of our, <laughs> as one of our top priorities uh, and looking at how we, how we can. And this is not just, you know, um, an association-led strategy. Um, all state Northern Ireland amongst um, around 40 or 50 other stakeholders contributed. So it was important this was industry-led. Talent and skills is right up there. Raising the profile of the sector in Northern Ireland is another. Looking at how we can support our startup and our scale-up sector here because there's a lot of really fantastic work happening in those very small companies that are, that are kind of out searching for, for the next big thing. Um, and financial support is one aspect of that, but oftentimes just providing with the right sort of mentoring um, mm -hmm. and other types of support as well. So talent and skills, raising the eminence, supporting our startup and scale up sector, um, and then really harnessing what our strengths are um, and looking at how we can bring together um, all the different parts of the ecosystem. And funnily, something dropped into my, my inbox earlier today. Uh, I think we have around 11 or 12 different strategies uh, all related around economic development in Northern Ireland. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of great ambition out there, and I think what we need to do is try and um, bring all that together and uh, make sure we're all pushing in the same direction. And John, I know Andrew mentioned there that you, you did have a, a role in this strategy, but I suppose, you know, from the point of view of an employer on the ground, what do you need to help, you know, make sure that there is nothing stopping your growth for the next three years? Uh, well, again, no surprise that access skills. to talent and skills yeah. is going to be top of, of my uh, list. Uh, businesses like mine, you know, we, we are doing really well. Uh, we continue to have full order books and, and you know, that, that uh, the, the revenue side, uh, and it really is now about the, the fulfillment of it. Uh, I think as a sector, you know, I was delighted to hear you, Andrew, talking there about the, the, the startup and, and, and the scale up side of the sector as well because you know, large FDIs are fantastic in terms of generating the skills. You know, two and a half thousand employees, we bring through you know, hundreds, uh, you know, literally hundreds of, of new entrants into the market on, a, on an annual, annual basis. Uh, so we're, we're doing our bit in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the skills, but that is really important uh, then to flow through and into the, the, the startup and scale up side. Uh, there is no reason why the next Stripe, a multi-billion uh, dollar company uh, that couldn't come from here. It, it should the next one should come from here? You know there there are just so many uh, fantastic businesses, and you know, we've got some really great ingredients in the ecosystem here, the fintech ecosystem that will help that. You know we've got the likes of Catalyst uh, here in 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 Derry and uh, Catalyst in in Belfast, who are really helping to nurture uh, those startups and bring those those companies through, and you know bringing in money from outside of here to help and, and, and to grow them. You know, so whereas a company like mine doesn't need the capital to, uh, to continue our growth, you know, it, small, some of those smaller startups really need to get that capital coming in. You know, so we need to put a focus on that and, and get more venture capital into uh, the FinTech ecosystem here in, in Northern Ireland. And you know, there are people out there who are really working hard uh, to make that happen because I, I, I believe that there are multi-billion dollar companies here that are incubating at the moment. I was going to say, just when you talk about homegrown talent, you take the example of First Derivative, Signori. Um, I, I, I mean, you know, again, a tremendously successful company in the financial technology, financial services sector. But, you know, so it is possible to, for companies to grow and to scale up, to create, you know, employment. And it's that cluster effect, you know, coming off the success of the cluster and then connecting other 
bits of, of, of the fabric together to try and, and look for the next new opportunity for indigenous. And, and a great example of a company that has diversified as well. Yeah. You know, when they were mainly around the financial service and then they, and then they diversified into uh, supporting Formula One teams as well because yeah. they had all that big data and analytics expertise. Yeah. So it's, it's exciting to see companies that maybe have started down a particular path and starting to broaden out the value that they can bring. Yeah. Uh, back to the AMA and to the economy. And Claude, I think, uh, I know I'm in the second city here today for this um, uh, panel discussion, but, you know, there are, you, can't you know... can't say that here, no, it is, it is, uh, you know, it is, I think you know, there might be some in the panel who say it's the first city. <laughs> yeah, OK, yeah, well, so, but, you know, you know, Belfast is the, is the number one, Andrew was talking about you know, where we sit, but Belfast is the number one um, world city in terms of attracting investment and growth prospects for, for financial technology at this moment in time. Um, Nuri, Again, supported by um, uh, Southern Regional College and Northwest Regional College here today. Again, all of those colleges are involved, Belfast Met included, are involved in supporting the growth of the sector and hope to be involved in the, in the future moving forward. And I know, Damien, I mean, the, the two kind of top of the list from Andrew and uh, from John there in terms of skills, you know, that's what we really need to work on. You know, what more do you think we could do to try and encourage more people into further education? Um, well, on average, Clodagh, uh, we do quite well across the six colleges. We would have an excess of 80,000 learners. So, so the numbers, are when you, when you take, uh, look across all of the colleges and the various campuses and sites in, in pretty much every town in, across Northern Ireland, um, we do well. Having said that, you know, I think there are potential to, to grow in, in certain places, for example, in, in terms of our higher education offer, and that requires partnerships with employers. So it is great to be here today with you know, two individuals on the panel that represent employers because it's employer-led conversations that will help us influence the shape of the curriculum, the apprenticeships, the academies moving forward. Without the employers, we do not have the job opportunities. So if we all accept that this is going to be, this sector is a priority for us in terms of growth and opportunity moving forward, then we as the sector and the FE sector will buy into that and, and put skin in the game to ensure that we are developing the opportunities for young people to come into the system and to gain skills and experience and opportunities as we move forward. So. Um, I think we you know, certainly um, welcome the opportunity to, to, to redouble our efforts in that conversation. I would say, actually, when I look at the, the structure of the conversation, there are various um, what are called sector partnerships that exist across Northern Ireland. There's one uh, in, in the sort of digital ICT sector, but you know, FinTech is probably at a stage now where it needs to, to, to work with the colleges and with the Department for Economy to establish its own dedicated sectoral partnership moving forward. And I mean, I suppose the, the point you made there about, you know, the fact that all of this is, these opportunities in education are employer led, you know, from the point of view of a candidate like Tracy, I mean, I am sure that that was, you know, whenever you were saying you were looking for opportunities, you want to know there's a job at the end of it. Yeah. You know, I suppose that's what makes it attractive and an attractive route to go down. Exactly. Exactly, and I think that what attracts you to the academy as well is the fact that, and it was said earlier, you don't have to come from that financial mm -hmm. services background. Like my experience in the academy, there was 20 people came together and we had vast backgrounds. There was languages, geography, um, legal. Um, I had a business, but you know, it was not everybody went, started out in their education deciding FinTech was going to be at the end of it. Do you it know also I mean? probably like, wasn't that big a deal whenever you started out. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, exactly it's, that. It's grown so much and changed so much now that I suppose it's maybe an opportunity people wouldn't have thought of then. Exactly. It's attractive to a whole lot of different backgrounds now. And I mean, Andrew, is that part of the challenge in terms of trying, I suppose it's probably, you know, one of the, the most exciting parts about the sector is that it's, it's growing so quickly and changing all the time. But does that then mean it is hard to keep up, maybe whether it's an education or an employer point of view, you're probably always trying to keep up on yourself? Uh, yeah, and I think that kind of comes back to the point I made earlier about, you know, the, the, um, about learning agility and just being ready to continue to invest in yourself and know that there is no li job for, for life and know that you know, when you're working in, in a company, whether it's a large company or a small company, you know, there's that constant learning, um, that you, you know, that learning journey that you're, you're on. So I think that, that is key to it. I think what, um, it's kind of come back to the point you made earlier on, there's, there's, there's probably more as a, as a sector we can do to be demystify mm -hmm. what, what FinTech actually is. And that was a good question asked us about fintech because I think it's important we kind of we get a sense of that. So I think there's more we can do to 
to, um, to demystify what, what fintech is and what sort of jobs and career paths there are available uh, mm -hmm. in fintech. And I mean, John, in terms of the types of candidates that you're getting approaching to you, I, I, I assume they will have had to do a certain amount of research that they must have, they might have some understanding of fintech or are you still trying to demystify a little bit yourself? We are looking for candidates right across the, the, the board and uh, right at the start of uh, the, the session today, Andrew talked about the importance of innovation and that's how you get innovation. You don't get it by having a room full of people who are all identical clones of each other. You get it by bringing people who have had different life experiences, who are bringing their ideas uh, to bear in terms of how we are designing these products, the look and feel of them, uh, the, the features that, that they have, uh, and that needs a, a diverse team. You know, so we, we're absolutely looking beyond the, 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 the bit of paper and we're looking to see whenever people turn up for an interview, how they interact in a, in a group, you know, what kind of team skills, what are they bringing above and beyond the bit of paper that, that yeah. Maybe the, uh, is, Damien has sort of alluded to like soft, soft, soft skills, skills yeah. but are very important yeah, skills. And, and, and you know, people call them soft, but they're, but they're absolutely essential skills yeah, yeah. Uh, for, for us uh, within uh, the, 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 the world of, of work. Um, I wanted also to pick up on something that you said, Andrea, around demystifying. Uh, the, the sector, and I think we have a job of work, and that's uh, as, a, um, uh, as a group of employers, but also the, the colleges, a, group, a bit of work to do with parents as influencers, you know, to, to make it easy for somebody to imagine their child in, in, in one of our jobs. You know, what are these companies uh, behind those doors and those offices? What are they actually doing? And we have a, a job of work to do in terms of uh, talking about the, the uh, success that, that, that people can have as they build their careers uh, within us, uh, within our companies, but also around the different routes. Uh, we need to get away from this idea that somehow uh, an apprenticeship is a, a, a secondary route in. You know, we need to get to a place where it's a primary route into uh, the, the, the world of work and, and you know, completely reorientate the way that people think about uh, education as a, as a route to employment. Uh, you know, we should think of employment as a route to employment yeah. uh, and get people through and into into these sectors, into our jobs, uh, gathering the, the, the skills, the accreditation, the certifications uh, as they go through by that lifelong learning and, and keeping in touch with uh, skills providers like the colleges. It can be difficult though, uh, for parents as well to that understand That was the point, it, you know, funny, so I was just about to put that know, to you, yeah, because um, I do think even just as we were chatting yeah. there and we were saying, you know, these opportunities wouldn't have been around yeah. at that time and we've heard how important the likes of a support system in terms of teachers are. I suppose, you know, from a further education point of view, that that could be part of your Absolutely. And, 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 I, and, and, I, and I think, you know, we, we've all been engaged in one way or another with, you know, um, trying to, to, to improve the quality in the, uh, of the conversations around careers. So in Belfast Met, for example, working with the other colleges and, and the technology sector, we have a programme called Bring It On which is about reaching out to young people in schools to help them to understand the pathways and the, the opportunities and companies come and, and talk to them and, and, and unpack some of that and demystify some of the terminology. I work in the sector and, and you probably, I'd say five years ago, I couldn't have told you the difference between a data analyst and a data scientist. Um, I couldn't have had a conversation with you on RegTech, you know, hopefully in a month or so I'll be able to know what it is and know what it means. Um, so the pace of change, you know, 10, 11 years ago, I, I went on a trip to, to Limerick to try and understand what big data was. You know, within five years, we've moved on to something completely different, five years. And that's what's happening in this space at the moment. Um, and the young people that are coming up behind, they're comfortable with that change. So the, the sort of the prospect of a job for life, you know, it will be a portfolio of opportunities and you've mapped it out very well there. You, you, you find your way into Fintry and you can see a whole range of, of you know, opportunities stretch out in front to go in different ways, to be a project manager, to be client facing. So that's the way things will work in the future. The, the chance of having you know, a career that stretches 25, 35, 40 years for some of, the, some of us that are old enough to remember what it was like to start in a career is that I think in terms of you know, the shape and the innovation in the workplace, the world of work, um, who would have said remote working? Remote working is here to stay. The norm. So it creates a whole new range of opportunities. You know, you don't need to relocate to the centre of London to work in the financial services or fintech sector. You can work, you know, from the centre of Oma uh, or, or Limavati. You know, so 
I think you know those. those it's, it's it's a great sort of time in terms of prospects and enthusiasm for what's to come for people ahead. Yeah, because I suppose you know rather than saying there's no job for life, it's that it's that young people won't necessarily want a job for life. Why would you want are. one job whenever there's so many other opportunities exactly. out there? Exactly. And uh, you know, in, in just with that same theme, as employers, we recognise it's our responsibility to help people move through their careers. Uh, and while the pace of change is a bit daunting, when you look at it and go, my goodness, you know, things are moving so fast, employers within the sector will help in terms of helping to guide you through and provide uh, the support as people transition from the job they're doing for us today to the job that we need them to do for us tomorrow. Uh, and uh, the, the, the platforms, the learning platforms that, they ha that we have, the relationships that we have back into uh, the further education sector in terms of providing uh, some of, of the skills that, that, that we need to retrain people through as, as they move through their career you know, is, is a real support mechanism for people who come into the sector. And Andrew, in terms of, you know, we've heard a lot about the, the growth that the sector is going through. I know you have been working on this three year strategy. I mean, have you got an idea of just how many jobs could be created in the next three years in fintech? So what we've looked at, Clota, is um, the number of the number of uh, fintech companies that we have in Northern Ireland today, and we have around 74, 75. So um, we're kind of more focused on the attracting um, more startup and more scale up growth within within Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. and we believe that we can grow that within another 25 percent over over three years. So it's it's really the the value um, of the of the sector, as opposed to maybe the, the, the you know putting a number on the on the jobs. Uh, we believe we can move from around 400 million to around a billion. Um, so that's mm -hmm. one of the, um, the aspects. In three years. So, um, so that'll be the jobs, 25% um, increase in companies in three years, and we're a little bit further out, maybe six years yeah. to um, a, thousand, a, a billion dollars in, or a billion pounds in GBA. And I mean, in terms of, I know we, we've spoken a lot about the, the talent pool here. I mean, do you think we have a big enough talent pool to sustain all this growth? So I, I, think, I think about it in a couple of different ways. Uh, we need to, first of all, retain the talent that we have. Um, so we, we, we still have a number of, of um, people every year that will leave Northern Ireland um, because maybe they can't find the places to study here. I think we also have a job to do to attract back. So people that have maybe left Northern Ireland um, and maybe are thinking about coming back and how we identify who those people are. And then attracting in as well, because I think we have to acknowledge that if we are to sustain, uh, sustain the, the growth that we anticipate, we're going to need to attract in more, um, more people as well. And I think when you can showcase uh, our areas of strength, they can act as a, as a lighthouse. You have that kind of cluster effect, and that will attract people back into Northern Ireland as well. So I think we need to look at in a number of different ways, as well as you know, some of the things that John has talked about. Um, re the, the reskilling that's happening within organisations as well. Yeah, and I mean, in terms of that kind of trying to attract people back, John, is that have you seen much of that from since the start of the pandemic? I know anecdotally, I even have friends who have thought, if I have to work from home, I'm not paying London rent when I can get somewhere bigger or you know get more more bang for your buck in Northern uh, and, Ireland. And Northern Ireland is not a bad place uh, to, to come and, and to, to live. Uh, so yes we have seen it. Uh, we've also seen because of the uh, the, the quality of the, the companies and the, the quality of the, the roles that are on offer here. Uh, we have seen not so much what you're saying Damien around people from here working uh, and se selling their services back into uh, into London but we've seen a lot of people who have taken our jobs here from from GB because of the just the the, the exciting roles uh, that are available. You know the challenge, the technical challenge, the, the the business challenge, and you know that's that's been one of the the phenomena that has really surprised me uh, in terms of uh, you know people from outside of here wanting from uh, from Scotland, from uh, the, the north of England to to come and uh, take some of our jobs, and I think that's really exciting as well because because yeah, I suppose yeah. if you said you you went to London whenever yeah, you wanted to get and, into this and, and, and now I've because the, the, the sector and, and the, the state that, 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 that we have got it to that we've grown it to and the, the quality of the roles and the quality of the companies uh, that, that's an attractive proposition and, and it's great to see it it brings again that diversity of thought into, into our businesses and, and makes us all better. I think the other thing Clodagh is you know and, and Andrew's mapping out the different sort of you know attract back and attract in there the, there's also a sort of commitment now moving forward to, to, to reskill and upskill. So there, there are tremendous opportunities 
that have been supported through the Department for Economy and delivered um, across the colleges for people in work or people who were impacted by furlough to yeah. acquire new skills or to update their skills and that that creates again you know a different type of of of, of group uh, who, who may be attracted into technology we've also um just relaunched again this on the second run of a program which john was instrumental in putting together which is called press refresh mm -hmm. for women returners I so really? so so for women who've gone off maybe on a career break or are homemakers and who want to come back in and again similar to the share skills program don't necessarily need to have had a background in technology so we're, we're getting very creative about how we sort of engage with with the population you said do we have enough people yeah we we, we have quite a few people you know it's yeah. just uh, how we connect that, with those people that's something so, that i whenever yeah. i was um speaking to an economist recently in terms of economic recovery that's what they were saying there are enough people yeah. it's hard to try and get them in a position where they can be reskilled or yeah. trying to get them back into the workforce you know i mean yeah. that that program's a you know a perfect example of yeah. that saying you know there are people who maybe just they maybe just thought well i have never worked in it before it, yeah. i don't know anything about it i don't know if it's for me yeah and and, and one of the hardest nuts to crack in, as an economy in northern ireland is, is a group where known as the economically inactive yeah. and, and some of those people are economically inactive through choice so have taken career breaks or sabbaticals and have uh, you know reared a family and, and and maybe lived overseas and come back so so tapping into that it isn't just a question of you know um Oh, it's, you know, it's a challenge. Well, let's just look at, at, at people who are, are, are unemployed. There, there are people who find themselves in different circumstances. Um, and, you know, when we, we cast our net far and wide, you know, we create new opportunities and, and then new programs that can bring people through that sort of stepping stone process to, to, to create, get them in a job interview with a fintech company. So, and I think, you know, to, to deliver on, you know, the billion pounds plus that, that, that I, I think, you know, the fintech sector is well capable of in the next number of years, we have to think in that way. And uh, there was a piece of work that the Department for Economy has done, which fed into, essentially said, what does it take to be a small, successful economy, you know, globally? And, and innovation and agility and talent and skills are part of the mix. And that's what we need to do. We need to put all those component parts together, better conversations with employers, more joined up. Um, the colleges, you know, bringing their agility to the table and actually developing, you know, a world-class capability, which we're capable of. I think that's exactly right. I mean, it, it, it's going to take a, a joined up approach to, to really realising the, the full benefits of, yeah. of, the, of the strategy. And I mean, that point about agility, I mean, Tracy, I suppose you're kind of the perfect example yeah. of, you know, trying to show how flexible you can be and moving from one role to another, you know, even just among your own peers. Is that something that now more people you've heard, you're thinking, I wasn't the only one who's made this jump, actually a lot of people you know there are opportunities out there if you are willing to be flexible yeah exactly that and a uh, flexibility is probably one of them skills that's going to stand you good stead throughout your whole career like um whilst we've said no job for life i think their fintech and financial services is certainly an industry for life like i said there's so many angles and areas you can go into um, there's plenty of room to develop in that industry and plenty of different opportunities and experiences to have. But from, I suppose, an employee-employer perspective, it is maybe seeing that potential in individuals and, and investing in them. And I think that's maybe something that Fintry in particular are fantastic at. Um, I've had a lot more like recognition and development opportunities in two years yeah. than I have over a whole career <laughs> span. <laughs> so. Well, thank you so much. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. That actually flew in. But thank you um, so much for watching at home and for all of your questions. And a huge thank you to all of our panellists, to Tracy and Andrew and John and Damien. And a huge thank you to the whole team here at Northwest Regional College who have um, been very professional. And thank you so much for having us. I'm now going to hand you back over to Leo Murphy. Thank you very much, Clodagh. And what a fantastic hour of discussion we've had there. So I want to take an opportunity to thank Clodagh for leading the discussion. I want to thank our panellists and also particularly to Tracy, one of our alumni, who put on such a great performance on the fantastic role that further education plays. So really, um, I think that's our big takeaway today. Further education is absolutely crucial to the development of the Northern Ireland economy. Uh, whether it's the fintech sector today, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's green technologies, further education provides the skills for work needed. 
In my thank yous, I want to thank Suzanne Rogers and her fantastic HND film study students who were brilliant today uh, in, in making this happen. Also thank our marketing teams. I want to thank Brian O'Connor and my leaving comments are for Damien Duffy. The oldest city that you're in now is the first city. Thank you very much. Goodbye.